here Sunday to Thursday, 10 to 1. It's Late Night Graham Torrington. And time now for my After 11 guest tonight, who's Annika. And she's finally ready to share her story. Uh, she's called it her trauma timeline. In her story of abuse, bereavement, domestic violence, mental health and more, it's the story that's made her compassionate, a survivor, and someone who knows and trusts herself. Already the author of six books, Annika has made her story the seventh, and she joins me on the programme right now. Annika, thank you very much indeed for joining me on the programme tonight. Hello, thank you so much for having me. So what kind of upbringing did you have then? Let's go way back. Okay, if we were to go way, way back. Um, my upbringing was very challenging. Uh, I think that's probably the quite nice way to say it, but I grew up with um, domestic violence, so like sexual abuse, um, as you think of council estate, uh, poverty, bev- benefits. Um, it was it was quite bleak and it was quite challenging. There's a lot of stuff going on for a young child, and I didn't really have a great grasp of it. Under, you know, understanding what it all was when I was little, I just it was just all that I knew. But growing up, what was the um, family being, setup like in, in those days? So again, my setup. Okay, so um, I have. Three siblings. I uh, had a stepdad, lived with my mum as well. I uh, had a family dog. And we, we moved around a lot. And we changed schools a lot. Hmm. When were you aware that you were experiencing abuse yourself? I didn't know until I'd gone to sc- one day I'd gone to school and um, it was NSPCC came in. And they did like a presentation. And then it made me realise that, oh, OK, actually what's going on at home that's not normal Uh, and for you what was that moment like realizing what really was happening in your life it was a weird real i can't get my words that was a weird realization but because i'd never been encouraged to talk about home um at school anyway it didn't kind of prompt me to start asking for help or telling people what's going on it did seem like in my immediate family that what was going on at home, most of it was genuinely quite known. It wasn't a secret as such. Were you sharing anything that was going on with close friends at all? Could you talk to friends? No. No. It was almost like a separate world when I was at home. That was a different kind of headspace to when I was outside of home and I was at school and now with friends, I was completely... It was almost like two different worlds. And which world did you prefer to be in in those days? In the world full of imagination and adventures, <laughs> which was a world with books and playing out with friends. One day you were forced to leave your home uh, city and end up in Yorkshire, so tell me about that. Yeah, I was around nine or ten. I was in primary school. It was very early on in the school year. Um, I remember on one day, one afternoon, my mum came into the classroom and she pointed me out and I was summoned up to get my things. Um, and we'd gone outside and it was a grandparent that was in outside school and some of our black bags, our belongings in black bags were in the back of the car. And we were hustled into the car and on that day we moved to uh, West Yorkshire um, from Birmingham and we went straight into refuge and it was just so sudden and it was just so unexpected and of course, I was only nine. I had lots of questions. I'd made plans to meet with friends after school. And back in the day, you didn't have mobile phones. You just said that you were going to meet at this place at this time. So I didn't get a chance to cancel or, or take all my belongings or say goodbye or anything like that. It was very much out of the blue. What were you told about why you were making this dash to Yorkshire? I wasn't told anything. Um, the excuse that was used was that a family member was unwell and we had to go to the hospital. So my immediate worry was about that, but I think that was more just to get us out of school. But we weren't really told just anything. I don't remember anything being said, just that we've moved. And because we'd always moved around anyway, and we did flee quite a lot anyway, um, I think the biggest shock was just that we'd, we'd moved out of Birmingham, not so much that we'd moved at all. So you're now settled in Yorkshire. So tell me what happened then when you were 16. I know that when I was... 16, we moved back down to Birmingham. Um, there'd been a death in our family and that kind of prompted my mum to want to be, return back to 
our family and just be closer to everybody um, on a geographic level as well. So we just moved back. Um, and that's why I've got a very much a Birmingham accent now and not a Yorkshire one. <laughs> yeah. So moving back to Birmingham, what was it like for you? It was a culture shock in the sense that I'd grown up in Yorkshire and that felt more like home, whereas Birmingham was more a place that we visited and also with Birmingham, there'd been so much sadness attached to the city for me, um, so many bad memories, that it just took a long time to, for it to feel like home, because it was just it was just all the all the memories attached to the place. And I think it's only been in adulthood when I've been able to recreate my own memories and put my own mark on it that it's really felt like home. You lost your mum when you were a teenager yeah. also. What do you remember at that time? I was 18 when I lost my mum. My mum was really young. My mum was 35 when she died. She was a teen mum initially. Um, it's really weird because it's almost like we knew that she was ill. She had lung cancer. And as much as you know, you know you're know, told that it's terminal, it doesn't actually feel real that they're actually going to go. And so when she died, it just felt like a big part of me had died. And I was so angry. And we were still, I was still at that age where I was arguing with my mum. We didn't get a chance to work through it and, you know, become close like I, I see other people. I was their mum today. Um, and it was the single most painful thing I've ever been through in my life. When you look back on that now, do, do you yeah. wish that you could wind back the clock and spend more time with your mum and talk about your feelings and what had happened? Um... I don't know. If, I wish we'd have had the chance to. I mean, the way that I talk about my emotions and reflect on stuff now, it, it, it that wasn't existent in me when I was 18. You know, I didn't know how to talk about my emotions. I didn't know how to feel my emotions or connect with them. But I just wish we'd had the opportunity to talk through everything because I think as a teenager I was so angry, but that was because I was a child who wasn't heard. But again, you know, she was also a woman who'd battled through a lot as well. So I think... It would have been nice to have had the opportunity for us to go through that healing process together. But so didn't. your mom, you lost when you were eighteen. You've yeah. been through a heck of a lot for yeah. uh, for a young girl at that age, haven't you? I mean, yeah. F for you, what? How do you actually equate what had happened in your life up until your eighteenth birthday? I I always used to say that it felt like my life was a series of events and that if it was to be made into a movie, it would be like three parts. And it just felt like it was one thing after another. So all I knew was how to survive this and then how to survive that. And uh, I, my life was very reactive. Um, and I always feel like I spent a whole lifetime surviving that I forgot. Well, not that I forgot. I didn't know what it was like just to be chilled out and relaxed and just live and just not have to worry about anything and not have to feel um, suspicious of the people around me and not be scared of everything. Um, but at 18, that's, uh, that's all I, I didn't have anything else to compare it to because that was my life. Do you wish that you could have had a childhood? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I feel like I, I feel like I had a childhood in some ways, like when I was with my grandparents because we had lots of holidays with them. Um, I used to get lost in books. You know, I was a very, very much a bookworm. Um, was that the escapism for you? I think so, yeah. I think that was my safe place. You mentioned about being wary of everyone. Why? Yeah. Just not knowing people's intentions. And I think when I was little, the anything that was innocent was robbed from me. And so it, there was, a, like I said, I think of it now, there were no boundaries. And when you're a child, you have to, you know, you don't get to decide who is in your life or, and who isn't. You don't get a choice in who has access to you and who do, who doesn't. Um, and I suffered as a, as a result of that. Whereas as an adult, those are decisions that I can now make for my best interests. Do you know what I mean? Um I think that's what it is. I think I think I had a voice. I think I knew I had a voice. It just was not heard when I was little. Let's roll things a little bit further forward now. There okay. was a certain amount of domestic abuse as well, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
in my recent years, do you mean? Yeah. Yeah, well, this is the thing, like, I feel like there was domestic violence there, but because it was different to what I'd experienced as a child, because nobody, because there wasn't no physical violence, I didn't, I didn't make the link. I thought it was better, so I didn't relate it to being, oh, you know, this is domestic violence. I just thought that this is, you know, not great, but it's, at least he's not hitting me, which is a weird perspective to take, but I think that's all I've known. And, um, and I think for me, it took me a lot longer to kind of identify it for what it was. Annika, let's just catch our breath here for a second, if we can. I need to take a break here for some music, but uh, we'll come back in a few moments' time and talk about life today and you actually confronting and telling your story. And we'll do that in a few moments' time on Late Night Graham Torrington. Here on to one o'clock tonight, it's Lena Graham Torrington. I'm talking to Annika. She's the survivor of several traumas that have shaped her life and her career. After many years of healing and after six published books, she's finally written the one about her own life. So then, Annika, when did you decide that you wanted to help other people? I decided, well, that started very early in age. Uh, when I'd moved from Birmingham to West Yorkshire and we'd gone into refuge, we had in the refuge as a playroom and as a children's worker that came in. And all I remember is that she came in twice a week and we did paper mache and I thought that was awesome. And so I really wanted at that age to do the job that she did. I thought that was mm-hmm. like the bee's knees. <laughs> um, but how so did, that, you, that how did you get involved in helping other survivors of abuse? Um, well, years and years ago, I used to work in the bookies. I was fascinated with domestic violence. I, when you, you know, say fascinated, when you say fascinated, it. what do you mean? I, I suppose when I was reading about it, I was learning more about myself. So I was intrigued by because um, the more that you read, then you have now you know now you have labels for stuff. You have a breakdown of symptoms, things to look for, and I suppose because I didn't have anyone to talk to about it doing my research kind of gave me um, the context of my childhood. Mm. Um, a long time ago, I used to work in the bookies, and then one day I saw in uh, the paper a job for a women's organisation, and it just seemed perfect, even though I didn't have no work experience. <laughs> I didn't have no work experience, and I was still quite young. I think I was about 20, but I applied for it, and um, through the application form, I, d- I gave enough for them to call me in for an interview. And in the interview, I demonstrated my passion, but also the experience I'd had. And um, by the time I'd got back to work and got off the bus, they'd called me and offered me the job. Would you say this was your dream job? That wasn't quite the dream job, but that was on the journey to the dream job, which came a couple of years after. Yeah, tell me about the dream job. The dream job was, so when I mentioned um, that I'd gone into refuge as a child and as a children's worker, her job was the dream job. And so I was a children and family support worker in a women's refuge. And it was just, it was so awesome. It was so good because I got to see um, and work directly with the children that came into refuge and their mums. Um, And it was almost like a a mini children's centre, but in a women's refuge, but really understanding what they're coming from and just seeing the transformation from when they get to refuge and they get to be children again to when they leave. Um, And they're completely different. Uh, And how did those jobs help you in your process of your healing? I suppose it gave me the other side of things in terms of when I was a child, I could only see things from a child's point of view. I didn't get to see the behind the scenes, the support my mum would have got, the support we would have got when we moved into accommodation. So I had a great understanding. So there were some questions that I had answered through the work that I did, but also um, being able to use my own experiences to really empathise and sympathise with the children and young people coming into the women's refuge. Uh, made me feel at least those experiences haven't been for nothing. I, like, I really do understand. So when did that dream job stop being your dream job? Well, it, it hasn't stopped being my dream job. <laughs> it was still the dream job, but I left because I decided it was time to pursue further education and because I'd achieved the dream job and I never really believed I would. Um, I wanted to see what else I could do. So I'd reduced my hours of working part-time and then started doing an access course and eventually quit my dream job so I could focus on finishing my education. Um, But I left with so much love and respect for the role, Um, but I knew that it was time to move on. Well, you'd planned to do 
social work to a degree, I believe, but you ended up st- studying something else. What did you end up studying and why? I ended up studying creative and professional writing, and um, I graduated last year, got a 2-1. Wow, um, well done to you. <laughs> thank you. Um, the social work degree, initially I thought I'd need that degree to do the, the dream job, which was a children and family support worker, but I didn't. And then while I did my access course, I changed my mind about the type of degree I wanted to pursue because I felt that I wouldn't be able to help families in the way that I wanted to because there'd be lots of paperwork and red tape and I think I'd feel quite frustrated at that um, so I just made a decision to kind of sit with it and just pursue something that felt like it would fit perfectly best you know fit, fit a lot better for me and that's when the uh, creative and professional writing degree popped up and it was mm. it was the one well you're a published author of six books now your first yeah. two books were published by this point uh, yeah where did you actually start all your writing off I don't know. I feel, you know when people say I've always been doing it, it feels so cliche to say that, but I feel like I have. But before I'd pursued my dream job, before I'd even had children, I used to write just privately in journals. I found online communities I used to write there. And it's only really been something that I took more seriously since I had children. Um, and the more that I... You know, I've I've been to poetry events and spoken to other writers and... At the moment, I, I'm part of the Writing West Midlands Room 204 Writers Development Programme. Like it, it starts more conversations, but then you can always also see what else is possible. And so I'm quite interested in trying new things and seeing, you know, if I can do this, if I can write this book, then maybe I can perform a bit of poetry. And then I like to see and explore that, that area as well. Well, by the end of your degree, you had six books published, but none of yes. them were about you and your own story. Why was that? I don't think I was ready. In some of that, in some of the previous writing, my stories weaved in there in some capacity, but I wasn't ready to take ownership of that and, and write a whole book about it. So why now? I feel like I've done some work to shift the shame that I've been holding on to from childhood. And I've had counselling, I've really looked at my mental health, I've gone way back and identified where I've been holding on to shame for things that weren't my fault, that I was not responsible for, but that I endured. And now that that's been removed, I feel, I don't know, I'm just more open and talking about it and sharing it. And I also feel that when I do that, it it can shape somebody else's life. Pretty big word, isn't it, that shame? Yeah, absolutely. How do you overcome that? For me, it was talking about stuff that I felt was shameful. Um, I had a counsellor who was incredible and she made me, well, she made me, she encouraged me to dig deep and talk, you know, way below surface level and saying things out loud that I've never said out loud and not having the person in front of me judge me or the world not fall apart because I've said it or anything like that is, it, it just, it just made a huge difference and I was no longer owned by it because I said it out loud and, I feel like it's a process. There's no one shoe fits all. Um, but I think talking about these things with someone that you can trust is, is definitely a good start. So does that mean you can forgive anybody for the past? I don't know if I can forgive as such, but I don't hold a grudge. I feel like I have greater understanding. I feel like I don't need to hold on to it and for it to hold me back in any way, shape or form. So why not self-publish this time, this particular book? Because I feel like my writing is of a standard where it could um, get traditionally published. I could self-publish, it's very easy. It's not that challenging for me to do it because I've done it so many times. But I feel like why stay in the comfort zone when you can aim for excellence? Like why stay here where it's nice and cosy and I know what to expect. I want to see what else I can do. And there's so much that I've achieved that I always wanted to that I never knew that I actually would do it. And there's some things that I've done that I never expected that I would. So why not Why not this? Annika, you share so much online, I know that. How, how does that impact your followers? Um, well, it's actually... I've had such a positive response because I share a lot of my personal journey online. So I share about writing, I share about the, the amazing things that I'm doing, but I also share um, battles with mental health and, and whatever's going on. 
And I find that whenever I've done a video, particularly on Instagram, about something that, you know, a reflection that I'm having or a learning um, moment that I'm having or like even a hard time, it, it prompts a response and the response is often a message that says, you know, thank you so much for talking about this because I've been going through it as well. Or um, even when I wrote my first book, I had someone found, find me on social media and message me and say, um, thank you so much for writing this because this has helped me rebuild the relationship with my mum. And, you know, comments like that. And for me, that is the real win because something I've shared has impacted somebody else. And that's just the things that people tell me. You know, there might be some people that have been impacted or inspired or touched in some way, but they've not contacted me. But I think if it's done it at least once, that's amazing for me because all I'm doing is just being myself. And it took me a long time to be comfortable with doing that and to have it, you know, have it been met with such a positive response. It's, it's so encouraging. It's, it really does help me still, even now. It really is amazing. It truly it is. If anybody wants to learn more about your work, maybe your books or follow you online, how can they do that, Annika? Uh, they can literally type my name in into everything. Um, a double N I K A S P A L D I N G. I have a website. I'm mostly on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm on everything. Um, <laughs> it's I'm dead easy to find. But there'll be something there that should grab somebody's interest. Definitely. Well, Annika, just to make it easy for my listeners, we've posted on my Facebook page, which is Late Night Graham Torrington, uh, ways that they can contact you. Thank Annika, you. Uh, truly amazing story. And I'm, I'm so pleased you've got to the point where you can be you, uh, feel happy with yourself, uh, and actually share it with others as well. Thank you so much. That means a lot.